Welcome to Hobby Clubhouse with a review of the HGUC Bound Dock. This hotly anticipated kit brings us one step closer to a full Zeta Gundam lineup under the HGUC line. Now short of only the Bolin X Saman, the Psycho Gundam Mark II, and the Hyzak Custom. To give some perspective on how long this has taken, the Cubile was HGUC number 004, released way back in September 1999 and the Bound Dock was released in Japan on October 24th, 2020. That is 21 years plus a month. So you can see why many fans have been looking forward to this neon pink space kangaroo. And as mentioned, this kit was released on October 24th, 2020, and the listed price is 5,500 yen. The kit comes in this insane huge box measuring 39 by 31 by 9 centimeters. So the front face of it is exactly the same size as the MG F92 box. Inside the box, we get 11 runners plus a few polycap ball heads, and with all the giant pieces for the front skirt, they take up a lot of space. There's a small sheet of stickers with one sticker for the mono eye, and then two triangle details for the forehead, and then four small triangles for the front of the shins. On the very bottom, we have the instruction booklet, and this time it really is a booklet because it's binded with staples. On the back, we have studio shots plus a coloring guide, and in the middle, we have the MS information and some background on the bound dock. The rest of the pages are in black and white and consist of the instructions for assembling the kit. While the kit may be big, it certainly didn't take a long time at about two and a half hours to build. The pieces are a bit big, but it isn't much more complex than the average HG kit, but the construction of it certainly is very unusual. And as you can see, the finished kit is tall, standing at 20 centimeters, and that's not even counting the ears. But more unique than the height is its length, and specifically, I'm talking about the skirt, at 15 centimeters. You can encase the entire entry grade RX-75 in the skirt. Most of this is empty space, and basically it's a Victorian crinoline, which adds the outlandish look of the mobile suit. While I said that many were looking forward to its release, it's a unique mobile suit rather than something with wide general appeal, which explains why it took them so long to make this. You know, that or they needed modern engineering to make this kit. But we'll get to that later, because there are a few problems here that even Bandai's best efforts couldn't solve. But first, let's look at some details of the kit. Almost all the coloring, from the searing hot pink to the bright yellow, is done in plastic like the round shoulder armor, and even the details on the claw arms on both the inside and the outside. And even the triangular details on the knee is done in plastic. So short of the few yellow stickers that we get, this kit is fantastically color separated. What's more, if you pull off the face, you'll reveal a very small but a movable mono eye. There's no lever or anything to move it, so you'll have to poke it with something, and when you do, it's going to get caught on the side like this, and when that happens, you have to disassemble the entire head to fix it. But the point is, Bandai could easily have just not done it, and it would have been easier altogether, but they did, and that deserves praise. The green pipes on the kit are made from the extra squishy thermoplastic rubber, which you've seen on kits like the Gaza C and the recent Char Zaku's flexible skirt. It's nice as straight build, and I kind of like the texture but they obviously pose problems for painting since the paint's going to flake right off when the material bends. And the odd thing is, the pipes aren't in any place where they're twisted when you move the kit, so there doesn't seem to be any real need to make them out of the soft material. One more thing about the pipe is this ugly exposed bit right here across the front of the neck. Now, you know, now that you've seen it, you'll always notice it. Plus, it's facing right out in the front. It could have been fixed with an extra piece going over the top and a small panel or something like that, but sadly that didn't happen. And here's a look at all that you get with the kit. There's a set of swappable finger parts with a lone palm on the bound dock. And then there's a strange square piece, and that's actually an action-based adapter, which fits very snugly into the thigh joints, giving you two 30mm holes for the action bases. And the MA form does need that offset hole. The beam rifle may look like a pistol, and the instructions was fooled as well. It calls it a smaller than average beam rifle, but this thing is actually huge. It's as long as the RX-78's rifle, and it has way more mass, so this thing can clearly do some serious damage. There's a rectangular peg on the side for the MA mode, and the trigger finger part actually has a peg on the inside that slots right into the handle. So this gun is nailed tight onto the fist, which is wonderful. And this great connection is paired with the excellent connection from the fingers to the palm. 
It's the same setup we've seen on the F92, but in that case, it keeps falling out. And here, the pegs give just enough friction that they stay on very tightly. So no complaints here at all. Next, we get a very long beam saver, which has no storage space on the MS and it just sits loose. You use the gripping fingers for this, and they hold the saber handles very tightly and very excellently. The kit comes with two MG size big yellow beam parts, and because they use the MG's 2mm holes versus the HG's 1.5mm, you can't actually use these beam parts with your other HG kits. Lastly is the scatter beam cannon, which is supposed to be stored inside the shield, but it doesn't actually store inside there, and you have to swap it in. And we'll be looking at this after transforming the bound dock into the MA form. And yes, the Bound Dock is a fully transforming kit with no part swaps, which will please many people, but don't get too happy yet. The transformation is a miserable process. If you follow the instructions and rotate the torso and everything, it does technically work, but you're gonna need to bend the arms in very particular ways, and you're gonna need to maneuver the head through some very tight spots. Like I said, it works, but the kit's gonna fight you the whole way, especially at the end, where the shield will mostly flat out refuse to sit down flush onto the skirt. I tried hard, trust me. So, my solution is to pull off the shield arm and the head, and then the entire upper torso, and handle the transformation separately. First, you swing the leg joints down and turn the legs to the proper angle. Then, you fit the torso back on under the skirt sideways like this. And then, you tuck the claw arm into its spot. Next, you fit the head into the proper place and tuck the rabbit ears away. Now, you fit the round shoulder armor back upside down like this. Then, you turn the wrist inwards on the shield arm and then close up the shield before curling up the entire arm. The arm is then ready to be reattached onto the torso, which hopefully, you can nudge the shield down into its place. I say hopefully because here's the final result of my transformation. The shield still arches up right here, and there's still a big gap right here, and trust me, I tried hard, and it took way more time and effort than I could ever enjoy doing this to the kit. And that's a shame, because this alien looking MA form is a key attraction of the kit, and the kit really doesn't like being twisted into this form. The UFO of the legs low can further change into the flight mode. So you swing up these two doors on the side of the skirt, and at least the legs are very cooperative, and they will easily turn into the massive claw arms, making a proper mobile armor. Now let's go back to the scatter beam cannon. To attach it, you take off this panel on the shield, which is really quite loose, though it just barely doesn't immediately fall off the shield by itself. You slide in the cannon's connector into the special rail on the panel, and then you reposition the whole panel onto the shield, and you have the cannon ready to fire. But in a baffling compromise, the cannon's connector is just wedged right into the shield, and you get this big ugly triangular gap on the shield. No doubt this is to prioritize the shield's normal look, and to keep it free of slits and openings. But I'm sure many of you will agree that this feels much more like they just gave up on the problem and just handed us the unsolved mess right here and just shrugged their shoulders and said, eh, I don't know. Now the clear green part on the shield is at least very nice, and at a distance, the hot pink UFO is going to draw lots of eyeballs on your shelf thanks to the excellent coloring and the sculpting with just the right amount of details on the giant skirt panels to not look strangely bald. And a small side note here, is that if you want to fix the shield problem when transforming, you can actually leave the shield arm detached from the torso, and it's going to fit nicely under the skirt, and it's not going to fall off or anything. It's a very satisfactory fix, but you know what? We really shouldn't have to engineer our own fixes and workarounds like this. And by now we know the bound dock is a tall boy, but just how bulky is it? Here's the bound dock next to the entry grade RX-75, and the RX-75 doesn't even reach the top of its skirt. Then, we have the taller Z a Gundam, but still it only reaches the top of the skirt, and it takes the Hyper Mega Launcher to match the full height of the Bound Dock. But don't be fooled into thinking that the Bound Dock is unique in being large here, as we have the very wide Virulent which manages to be just as wide as the skirt is long. The Bound Dock had quite a few other big piers like the O and the Masala which I don't have, uh, but really it isn't the only big MS around in the era. Now let's move on to the articulation. Starting from the top, the bunny ears are attached on ball joints, so they can be rotated freely into any angle. 
The head sits on the neck with the ball joint, so it rotates a full circle and it nods up and down a little bit. The neck itself attaches to the collar area with another ball joint, so all combined you get a wide range of motions even though the head is quite pointy. The right shoulder armor can flip upwards a little bit and it rotates independently of the entire arm. The arm can rotate up and if you don't rotate the armor, it swings all the way up to here and then back to here. The bicep itself actually doesn't rotate even though it looks like it does. Rather, the rotation is handled at the elbow joint. The elbow itself is a double joint and it folds comfortably close to 180 degrees. The claw arm rotates on a ball joint and the small claws each rotate on two pivot joints while the big claws each rotate along a single big pivot joint. For the shield arm, the shoulder armor flips up as well and also rotates independent of the arm. This arm rotates at the top of the bicep rather than the elbow. And the elbow here is a single pivot joint, with the wrist having another to make it a slightly unusual but still close to 180 degrees fold. The shield is actually two separate parts and don't lock into each other. The front of the shield can pivot along the wrist like so, while the back of the shield sits on a pivoting arm and it can be adjusted in a wide range of positions to fit the arm in any pose. It's a very sophisticated design, and looks just as if it's a part of the MS's engineering all along. The upper torso meets the waist with a ball joint, and the waist pivots along the skirt on a single plane. Together, they give you a good range of forward and backwards movement, along with a full rotation of the upper torso, which is necessary for the transformation. The skirt itself can be slightly angled down if you want, and the three thrusters on the back are each individually articulated, which is excellent. The legs swing forward just a little bit, and despite the giant skirt, they go back only to here because the shins themselves are actually quite bulky as well. These armor pieces on the thigh can flip up, and they do have some nice details underneath. The knee is double jointed, and they can swing backwards like so. And they also swing forward because they have to allow the claw transformation. The whole feet assembly rotates on this big ball joint, and the front toe pivots on two joints as do each of the two ankle claws, so you'll have no problems having the claw foot rest flush with any ground in any pose. With all that said, here's the Hobby Clubhouse 3-point verdict on HGUC Bound Dock. Number 1. It has amazing and sturdy articulation in the mobile suit form. It's hard to find fault when this many joints lets you position the claw arm, the shield, and the head and everything else in exactly any pose you please. And what's more, the joints aren't fiddly and they aren't fussy, so you're gonna have a good time posing the bound dock as a mobile suit. Number two, it has a frustrating transformation. I mean, you know it's bad when you sigh in relief when you finally finish and get it into the MA form, and you know it's bad when you dread having to change it back. On top of that, that's assuming you even get that far without the shield just refusing to sit right no matter what you do. I mean, I found a quick fix here, but it shouldn't have to be this way. Number 3, it's either the best kit ever or it's silly as hell. I mean, I don't even think fans of the kit think the design is that great. I mean, we want it because it's the bound dock we've known for that many years. I doubt anyone can justify why it goes from space kangaroo into a derpy UFO with long legs, and it's hard to blame anyone for finding the color scheme obnoxious and garish and ridiculous. I mean, none of it has any reason to be that way, and yet, there are those of us who are happy beyond measure when this kit was announced over 6 months ago. To those of you in that camp, the bound dock for the HGUC line is something very special. You know, and to the other people, yeah, we actually already know that it looks as dumb as hell. But on that note, that wraps up the Hobby Clubhouse review for the bound dock. They and I had the audacity to make it, so are you crazy enough to get yourself one? Thank you so much for watching. Come hang out with us on social media, and the links are in the description below or come hang out some more with these other videos. But before you go, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to be notified when there's a new video from Hobby Clubhouse, and I'll see you next time.